G'day, I'm James. It used to be a standard part of the American high school curriculum to teach a method of dividing polynomials, polynomials by linear terms actually, by this process called synthetic division. One draws a strange little table, but out pops the answer. Fine. And in about 2011, the Common Core State Standards came on the scene, and those folk actually took out synthetic division from the curriculum, no longer required. Okay, fine. But recently, many states have been rejecting the Common Core and rewriting their own standards yet again, and many have put back in synthetic division into the curriculum. And again, I say, fine. Because the thing is, I actually have no objection to teaching any piece of mathematics, as long as it's done with thinking, context, and meaning. If it's done without thinking, without meaning, then I have big problems. For example, it is often the case that many people will teach students this mysterious method without explanation. Just do this by pencil and paper and out pop the answer. To which I would say if it's done for just getting answers as a black box method, then that is morally wrong and absurd. Because any reasonable 21st century thinking adult would get out one of these things. Just type that into Wolfram Alpha in any way you like and out will pop the answer. If, if your goal is just to get answers, doing my pencil and paper is absurd in the 21st century. However, I do agree with teaching synthetic division if you want to teach it, and want to teach it with thinking, meaning, and context. So I want to go through now what is going on behind synthetic division in case you wish to teach it. Because actually it's a great piece of mathematics. All mathematics is a great piece of mathematics. You've got to see it in the right light. So first of all, let me give you some context. I did an earlier video about rectangles whose perimeters and areas happen to have the same numerical value. So let me just go over that, because that actually is a good motivation for synthetic division. So if you don't recall, in that video, um, I noticed that a 3 by 6 uh, rectangle, some units, has area 3 times 6, 18 units squared, and perimeter 3 plus 6, 3 plus 6, 18 units. I know this is units squared, I know that's units, however, their numerical values are the same. Crazy. There's another one with that property, namely a 4 by 4 rectangle, also known as a square, has area 16, perimeter 16, the same numerical values. So I asked there as my puzzle, are there any other integer rectangles with area and perimeter having the same numerical values? Okay, well let's solve that right now. I'll quickly go through what we did. Oh, that pen's not working. Uh, let's try this one. Let's try this. So in general, I want A and B to be integers, so an A by B rectangle, and I want its area A times B to equal its perimeter. A plus a B plus a second A plus a second B. 2A plus 2B. So swiftly going through this, I'll go very speedily because you should look at the other video for a nice uh, paced uh, approach to this. Um, let me just bring all the Bs to one side and solve for B, so we get an equation for B. So I get AB take away 2B. So AB take away 2B, we have to be two A's. Uh, common factor of B, which means I have A minus 2 times B, so it tells me B must be 2A times A minus 2. And what makes me a little nervous right here, because it looks like B wants to be a fraction, 2A over A minus 2, which is annoying because I said I want integers. Okay, so let's engage in a very standard technique for mathematicians is to engage in wishful thinking. I wish this was an integer. Namely, I wish that top line was a multiple of the bottom line. Can I make 2a to be a multiple of a minus 2? And the answer is, well, no. I mean, that's, that's kind of silly, but I still want to go for it. I still want to go for it. So I'd rather have 2 times a. I've got a multiple of a on the top line. I want a multiple of a minus 2 on the top line. So I'm just going to make it happen. I'll make it a minus 2. Great. Well, let's just change the question. I can't just put it in minus 2 right there. I better counteract what I did with a plus 4 on top. So, okay, I didn't quite get my wish, but I at least did get 2 times a minus 2 over a minus 2. I did get an integer plus an extra little term, 4 divided by a minus 2. But here's the lovely thing. I kind of like this form in the equation because now I see I need a minus 2 to be a factor of 4. That is, I need a minus 2 to either equal 1 or 2 or 4. And then you find if a equals 1, uh, a minus 2 equals 1, a must be 3 and b be 6, I'm to that rectangle. If a minus 2 is 2, turns out a equals 4 and b equals 4, I'm to this rectangle. And if a minus 2 is 4, turns out a equals 6 and b equals 3, I'm back to that rectangle. And there right now you prove that these two rectangles are the only integer rectangles with area equal to perimeter. All right, so that's a great puzzle, but it motivates what people want. They want polynomials to be multiples of other things. So often that comes up in mathematical puzzles like these. So let's talk about how could I check whether one polynomial is a multiple of something simple. And if it's not, how can I make it happen? 
Welcome to this game. That's what we're going to do here. So let me now clean the board and let's start asking when are polynomials multiples of simple things and just play with it and see what comes out of it. Because there's great fun thinking in this. Thinking. Back in a moment. Okay, I'm back. Here are two questions, two unusual questions. I don't see them presented this way in a textbook at all. I think they should be presented this way in textbooks. So going on the theme about me playing with integer rectangles, I'm left with questions like this. How close is this polynomial, 2x squared plus 7x plus 3, to being a multiple of x minus 1? It probably isn't, because I just kind of like made it up, but how close is it to being 1? Well, let's find out. Let's engage in the wishful thinking we played with before. For example, right now I've got 2x squared plus 7x plus 3. Let me march through this term by term. I want multiples of x minus 1. I want to see everything to be a multiple of x minus 1. And I look at 2x squared and say, well, it's not a multiple of x minus 1, but at least there's a multiple of x. I can at least think of this as 2x times x, and then I've got the 7x and I've got the 3. All right? But I want a multiple of x minus 1. Don't have it. Make it happen. If there's something you want in life, make it happen. I'll put minus 1 there. But there are consequences. I can't just change the polynomial. So I've got 2x squared, yes, but now I've introduced a negative 2x. Let me add a 2x here to counteract what I just did. All right, so I'm doing this bad bore technique. I'm being a bit scrawly here, but maybe you can see what I'm doing now, because now I've at least got the first term to be a multiple of x minus 1, but now I've got a 9x and a 3. Well, let's keep going. Let me now work on the 9x. Well, that's clearly a multiple of x, but I want a multiple of x minus 1. Okay, my advice is make it happen. 2x, x minus 1, plus 9 times x minus 1. There's the 9x, fabulous. But I've introduced a minus 9. So let's add a positive 9. Plus 9, I've still got the 3. Oh, and that's probably the best I can do. Equals, equals 2x times x minus 1. It's 9 times x minus 1, plus 12. So it's pretty close. In fact, I can see all that is a multiple of x minus 1. This equals x minus 1 times something. I can even write down what the something is. I'm not going to worry about it plus 12. So it's almost a multiple of x minus 1. It's off by 12. There's an error term of 12. Great. Great. That's the game I want to play. In fact, let me do it with this one. How close is this polynomial x cubed minus 2x plus 1 to being a multiple of x minus 5? Now, look what I'm about to do and compare it with the standard algorithm. Okay, here goes. I'm gonna play exactly the same term. I'm gonna go march through each of these terms here, try to make each of them multiple of x minus five this time, and um, adjust if I'm not quite right. Okay, here goes. x cubed minus two x plus one. x cubed, that's at least a multiple of x, but I want a multiple of x minus five. So I'm gonna make it happen. This is x squared times x minus five. So I can't just randomly throw in a negative 5x squared. I better add in a 5x squared, and I've still got a negative 2x, and I've still got a 1. All right, that's a multiple of x minus 5. 5x squared, that's certainly 5x times x. It's a multiple of x, but I want a multiple of x minus 5. Well, make it happen. This is x squared times x minus 5, plus 5x times x minus 5, but I'm now introduced to random negative 25x. So let me compensate by putting a 25x here, minus uh, 2x plus 1, so I've still got left hanging around. So that combines to 23x. So I've got, here I've got x squared, x minus 5, plus 5x, x minus 3, plus, uh, x minus 5, sorry, plus 23, 25x take away 2x, times x, but I want to multiply x minus 5, so I'll just make it happen. But I've introduced a uh, uh, negative uh, 115. So I better add in 115, plus I've still got the plus 1, so I was really adding in 116. So I can see that this beast here is really some multiple of x plus 5 plus an error term 116. It's really x minus 5 times something. I can even tell you what the something is if I had to, plus 116. So it's close to being a multiple of x minus 5. We're off with an error term of 116. All right, um, you can't see me because I'm looking through the writing right now. Let me clean the board a little bit, but let me see if we can make sense of these error terms because there's got to be something significant about the number 12 here for that polynomial and the number 116 here for that polynomial. So let me clean the board a little bit and I'll be right back. Oh, before I go, what do you notice? Do you see the 1s, 5s, 23s? Do you see the 5s, 25s, 115s? <laughs> All right, so here's what we have so far. So we had this polynomial, 2x squared plus 7x plus 3, and we changed those parts, being multiples of x's, to be multiples of x minus 1, which is fine, but we had an error term of 12. 
And we had this polynomial as well, and these first parts are multiples of x, but we changed the multiples of x minus 5 and got an error term of 116. So it's close to being a multiple of, 100, of x minus 5, just with that error term. In fact, before I go on and think about what these numbers mean, let me say in general, you can always do this. Um, any polynomial, oh, marker not working, any polynomial, uh, ax to the n plus bx to the n minus 1, go down, 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 doesn't how long it is to say cx plus d can be written by what we did, just do the exact technique we did as x minus h times something. If you want to do like x minus 1 or x minus 5 or x minus minus 3, which would be x plus 3, so on, plus an error term. So plus an error term. So we can always do that. Any polynomial can be written as a linear term times something, any linear term of your choice, but there might be an error. In fact, there is an error in most cases. Great. So now the question is, what does that error mean? Let's go back to the very first one. It's this polynomial equals x minus 1 times something plus 12. It seems irresistible to put in the value x equals 1, because look at that. If I put x equals 1, all that disappears. So if I put in x equals 1, so put in x equals 1, I will get equals 0 plus 12. This 12 is the result of putting in x equals 1 into the polynomial. Okay, look at this one. It seems irresistible to put in x equals 5. So I do that, 0 times whatever, 0 disappears. All that disappears. So put in x equals 5, put in x equals 5 into this, and you will get 0 plus 116. 116, 0 plus 16, 116, 116 is the result of putting x equals 5. This error term is the value of the polynomial at x equals 5. This error term is the value of the polynomial at x equals 1. This error term is the value of the polynomial at x equals h. This is the value of the polynomial at x equals h. So actually, we've just proven, if I'm interested in factors of x minus h, any polynomial can be written as a multiple of x minus h, with an error term which happens to be the value of the polynomial at x equals h. That's called the remainder theorem. Mathematicians have noticed that, that that's called the remainder theorem. I'm just playing with this thing called synthetic division without even, even doing this weird table thing, but it's the remainder theorem. In fact, it goes a step further to give you something called the factor theorem. Because if it turns out the value of the polynomial at x equals h equals 0, if if the polynomial is 0 at x equals h, I'll just write p for polynomial has value at h has value 0, then, well, the error term would be 0, which means actually the polynomial is an exact multiple of x minus h. Then x minus h is a factor of the polynomial. Whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. So, this is a part of some curricula. In the US, the factor theorem and the remainder theorem, uh, I think, are optional. In other countries, students definitely have to know the factor theorem and the, and the, um, and the remainder theorem. Um, they often do it just as cold stated facts, often do it by using this mysterious table method, but actually, everything we've just done is the thinking story to these high powered theorems. So, if you've got a polynomial, like, uh, I don't know, I'll do this one. Du -du 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 x squared minus 25, I know right away putting x equals 5 into that polynomial gives me 0. So the error must be 0. That means this equals x minus 5 times something. Actually, putting in x equals negative 5 as well gives me 0. So actually, in the something must be a factor of x minus negative 5. x minus negative 5, x plus 5 times something. And now I actually tell, deduce what the something is, because if I expand this part, I've already got x squared, and this can have no x's in it because I've already got an x squared. So this must be a number. Uh, x times x times a number must be 1. So this number here is 1. So actually, I've now completely factored this particular polynomial. In fact, I've just derived the difference of two squares formula from this factor theorem. Okay, so that's the true thinking behind the story of synthetic division. Getting the results is immaterial. 
I bet just go to the calculator for that. But if you teach the story of the proper nature of factoring polynomials, motivated by puzzles like, you know, rectangles of equal area and perimeter, then it's an actual delightful story that takes a while to pass. I went through this extraordinarily fast, but hopefully you've seen some of these ideas before and now you know where the story goes, where it lies. And I have no trouble teaching this table method if it's part of the thinking story. In fact, it's kind of fun now to figure out what did I do in that table and how did it match the work I was doing over here earlier on? Because you could see the parallels. So go back and rewatch that part of the video, watch what I did here, and see if you can work out what the method is on this table. That's the fun of synthetic division. Well, in fact, it's kind of, it is fun. No objections to teaching it. Teach it with the fun, teach it with the thinking, teach it with the context.